Well, hi, and welcome to my shop. Thanks so much for joining me here on November, December, December 4th, December 4th. So yesterday I started the sort of bringing this radio uh, up on power and I managed to light three of these five tubes or were they all lit and I just couldn't see it because it's very hard to see when these tubes are lit up. Uh, these ones are all uh, covered in that mirror, internal mirror uh, effect from the uh, getter inside. So I've decided to include an another meter in the circuit here. That's an AND meter sitting over here. Uh, I don't use this meter very often. Um, it looks to me like it might be limited to 99 milliamps. I'm not sure. So uh, we're going to turn it on and see what happens. Uh, and then, so each of these tubes draws about a quarter amp, so it should be pretty obvious how many tubes are drawing current. At least that's my thinking. Okay, so the uh, set is off right now. I'll turn on the supply. Okay, we've got 5.6 volts here. No load. Okay, let's turn it on. Oh, 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 not much happened at all. This is point one, point point two milliamps here. Point the decimal points right above my finger there. That's not right. Uh, are any tubes lighting up? Let's see. Got every light on in my shop here. And the answer is uh, no. Okay, so something's gone a little wrong. I wonder what that is. Let's turn it off. Yes, there, there is a there is definitely a current being drawn by it, but uh, not correctly now that I make a mistake here. Second, second. No. I think it's going to be something like a bad clip lead. Something of that sort. Okay. Let's try again. Still have 5.4 volts. Overload. And if you look at what tubes are lit, I can faintly see this one. You can't see what I'm even pointing at. I would say two, no more than two. So this meter is not going to do the trick. It's overloaded. Okay, switch off. I have to find myself another ammeter. This is the second one I've tried. <laughs> it hasn't worked out. Okay, we're going to find another ammeter. How about that big master craft one up there? Okay, you got to dig it out. Okay, let's give this one a go. Voltage and current, switch on. Switch on. Nothing. When these leads is bad. There's no voltage showing up now. Well, well, we're going downhill here pretty quick. What kind of dumb thing am I doing here? Hmm. Maybe what well, says unfused. I was going to say maybe the fuse is blown in the meter. Although I virtually never read current with it. How come nothing? Creepers, creepers. Um, I'll just take the ammeter out of the circuit here and see what happens. Okay, switch it off. Okay, ammeter out of the circuit. The voltage is back. Okay. 
this wasn't pushed in on the far enough. These leads don't fit. Oh, there we have the voltage back. Okay, so I think maybe this time it'll read. I just had not pushed these in hard enough here. Okay. Let's hit the switch. Quarter amp per tube. There we go. Very good. So I'd make that out to be three tubes operating. And uh, that's kind of what I see. Okay, so that kind of verifies where we're at. Now I'm going to wiggle the two tubes I believe are not operating. See if there's any jump in the current while I'm doing that. Try not to get right in front of the... Yeah. <laughs> hey, camera work. Let's try it like this. Let's try it like this here. We'll just turn this like that. Everybody stay there. Nobody fall. Okay. Wiggling the first tube doesn't appear to be working. Nothing. Oh, nothing. Nothing. It's in eight. And this one, nothing. I'm going to wiggle the working tubes just to judge the quality of the contact. There's nothing jumping at all. Oh, oh. Okay. Here's one. So I'm just pushing the tube downwards. It makes contact. Was that the true of these ones? Or just push them down? Don't go. Oh. Socket contacts. It's got to be what we're up against here. Oh, that went down. I have more lit than I realize. Five volts now. Yeah, the voltage jumping around, but the current not. Okay, I think that's enough testing. I think uh, we know what the story is on these tube contacts. Okay, power off right at the source here. There we go. So these tubes probably should not be operated sideways. I can't tip this on its side and operate the radio. Um, the filaments may droop inside the tube and uh, short. Not sure if that's true or not, but I don't want to find out. I'm going to tip it on its side for now, but not operate it. I'm going to take the bottom off and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll examine the, uh, the tube uh, sockets here. those fantastic coils. I'm a little worried about losing these screws, so I'm going to put them back in while we look this over. Must have been quite a deal to manufacture these coils. So uh, there's also a uh, rheostat control controlling the heater current going to the first two tubes in the radio. Um, I vary that current, you vary the heater temperature, 
and uh, the effectiveness of the tube. So the tube's gain goes up and down. So you can see quite clearly the bottom of one of the sockets right here. You can see how it's done. It's just four fingers coming over. Uh, you push the tube in, the pin pushes the finger up. And the finger is spring, springy, so it's pushing back. So that's the contact right there. Not much we can do about it down here. The, uh, I'm looking at how, how they've assembled these fingers. Can they be dropped off easily and cleaned up and then put back on? Doesn't look like it. Does not look like it. Let's take a closer look here with the other camera. Now we, now we can get a good look at uh, the condition here. Uh, so again, again, this is the back side. This is also the side uh, that dirt would not collect on. Dirt's falling from the top. Okay, if we look at the first one again. Looks like they've simply uh, bent the metal pieces in, like right here. That's how it's held in place. And you can see other pieces are bent in, like this, this tab here. So uh, this is not something you can take apart, I don't think. You run the risk of breaking all those tabs. Some, some kind of uh, non-corrosive metal. Now the other ones, wow, are really hidden from view, I think. Underneath here, because they're underneath these green coils. You really can't see them. And there's one more underneath this coil here. Really, really can't get a look, but there's not much to see from underneath anyway. We see how they're constructed. Okay, so I'm going to flip this back down. We're going to take a look. We'll pick this tube. Okay, now we look at these. What have they done here? They've, uh, there must be another material on top. It looks like uh, like some kind of cloth, almost like a metal metal cloth. What is that? All black. There's something on top of those fingers that we're looking at now. Um, or they've done something to the surface of the fingers, thinking that this was some kind of improvement. Uh, let's look at another one here. This one looks much cleaner. This is one of the working tubes. You know, I look at it with my own eyes, it's quite clearly that they've done something, they've scored the top of the metal or they've applied something to the top of the metal here. This is another one that's working. Almost like a, like, like a large file surface. I think for sure that's trying to make contact with the bottom of these pins. That's all it is, though. It's just the bottom. These these are rounded, of course. It's kind of like a point contact. It's early, you know. Early. It's the early design. Okay, now these two tubes. Hey, who's that guy? There's. Uh, what's different here? These ones don't appear to be working. They look great. You can only push these tubes in so so far. Um, you can't over stress the uh, the metal like like these uh, plungers can't they can't be bent so far they they won't bend back. That's what I want to say. Now this one's got funny funny marks on all the surfaces. What could you possibly do about that? I mean, there's no sign of the construction of these 
up here, is there? Oh, there's all kinds of bent tabs here, look. Uh, you know, it's, it's attractive to, uh, to bend those tabs back, slip the part out. But the problem is when you go to bend them back down, and then reinstall, there's a good chance they'll break. And it, certainly if you do it twice, I think you can be almost guaranteed they would break at that point. It's really not not a, not a, not a way to go. What are you going to do about this? How do I know for sure? Like the, it doesn't look like a surface that would make a bad contact. So something more is going on. Something more must be going on, I think. Now wait, let's go back to this first tube here. Let me switch back to the camera like this. Um, first tube. This is the one I had to push down on to make contact. Now these ones do look bent out of shape. They look like they're depressed in. I can just bend them back. Is there something else that's happened to the socket? The socket also, I noticed this before, has this twisted steel wire going around the outside of the socket as if to tie the socket in. And can you see there's a crack right here and a crack right here on the socket? So I don't know if they're trying to, and there's, look, there's a crack here too. Right here. I wonder if this socket uh, failed. It look, looks different than the other sockets. Like this socket, you can see tabs shoved down in. A little hard to see, but right where my finger is, there's a tab going down under the board. This one has tabs, but they're not down in. I think this is a different socket here. This is the uh, grid leak resistor here, right beside this. And those contacts are really dirty in this one. This is the one where they are dirty. But if I pushed it down, it did seem to heat up. So maybe just making contacts enough. There's one in particular that sunk low. Why though? Why, why, what, what happened? This is the tube that was in there. I can't imagine the tube pins are a different uh, length. I mean, it's got to be all standard stuff. Yeah. They're shorter, if anything. These ones are shorter. I'm sure, I mean, this has to be fairly standardized. Something's allowing it to go further down than, than maybe it's a different. Uh, socket here it appears to be set lower would be the distance between the pin and the uh, what what is it that's going on what is it that is going on can I get a this ruler in there oh I can't Okay, so from the top edge, right, let's use the right, well it does start at zero. <laughs> Give me a ruler that starts at zero. Here's one. Okay, almost starts at zero. If we measure here, it says 30 centimeters to the top edge. 30 uh, millimeters, not 30 centimeters, 30 millimeters. Okay, try this one. It's the very same, 30. This socket is, is treated differently for some reason. This is only sunk down. 20 from the deck, and these ones over here, 30. And that makes sense, this, this bottom part is sunk down. 
Well, they've done something different here, and I'm having trouble with it. You know what? These tubes, when they go in, I was thinking this 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 bottom part here bottoms out, but it doesn't actually bottom out. Bottom out onto this surface. Because if it did, you'd be pushing this much pin through. It'd go right past those little plastic little uh, contacts. So this goes down a certain distance. is locked by the pin here. Um, can't go any further. Okay. So what do we? What's it feel like? So it feels like it's in contact. And then hardly. Oops. Did I get it to go down? thing too is you're rotating and locking this tube in. You're turning the pins inside those little holes. There's no lot of room there. I wonder maybe I didn't have this one all the way down. What am I fooling around with here? 226. Let's not mix things up. So this is loose enough in the socket that you can put it in and then this pin can disengage from the slot. That's why they were trying to tighten this up, probably, to stop that from happening. So the tube would stay, because look, it's as loose as can be actually. And that's because those little pads are pushed down. I have the feeling if I push them up, they, they're just going to spring right back to where they were. But I'm going to try that. Oh, I can't get at them. They're underneath the big green coil. Wow. Okay, so if this has been changed out, which is not very likely, but if it has, Somebody's done a lot of work. They had to take that coil out to get it out of the way, desolder everything, resolder everything. That would be a lot. And you just think, socket? The the hole in the deck looks different from the rest of the tube. So I think this is probably original. Why it's cracking, uh, you know, back in 1925. Cracks go way down. They go way down. This wire may have slipped down a bit. Pull it back up. That wire will interfere when you put the tube in. What did I do with the tube? I put it over here with the other ones. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get these mixed up at some point. So now if we put it in. So it's so loose. This piece appears to be bent outwards, too. The whole thing seems cockeyed. I'm not sure that's going to help with the contact at the bottom, though. Is there something I can get in there and pull them up? I could pull three of them up by putting a tool through one of the holes. I could get it three of them and pull them up. Why don't I just give that, let's just give that sort of a try. I can try this tool here. Go in here, come around, ground under that one and pull it up. But it's just spring material, so I don't think it's going to stay, even if it comes up. And it's just going to be... I don't think it's making much difference here. This is the real low one. Cleaning them. 
how would you ever clean something like that? from bending metal you, you need to bend it past where you want it to be you have to bend it enough that you're straining the metal uh, so you know stress and strain stress a metal stress stress a metal when you let go it springs back to the way it was strain a piece of metal and when you let go it does not come back to the way it was some metal can take a lot of stress before strain occurs other metals, one of which we're very familiar with in the shop here, cannot take any strain, any stress, without straining the metal. Here, this is what I'm talking, I'm talking about solder. How much springiness is there in solder? So, there is none. Well, there's a little bit, isn't there? See, there's a little bit, but it doesn't take much to strain it. springier the metal is, the harder it is, of course, to get it back, to uh, bend it. Wow, okay, that's a big problem. Um, I could spray some contact cleaner in there. I think it would be harmless. Might help the situation. I don't know what else I could do. You get a little brush, contact cleaner and brush, kind of clean them up. That's about all I can do there. Now, these two tubes, these two... Hey, up here. These two tubes are the ones that don't seem to come on at all. Um, where they are in the circuit, I don't know. So we have three tubes doing R. We have two, two tubes doing RF. One tube is the detector, and then after that, two tubes are doing the audio. Take a wild guess. Well, I don't think it's a wild guess. So this is the detector. I'm pretty sure of that because the uh, resistor is right here. Um, probably these are the front end tubes. I don't know. It's not, that's really a guess. The schematic diagram doesn't really lay it out for us. The reason I'm concerned is the first two tur turds, first two turds, <laughs> are controlled by the rheostat. You can just see back here. The rheostat. And the rheostat is open, or something's up with the rheostat, then uh, it's another case of a piece of uh, spring metal, steel. That'll be steel. Steel is where you get good, good, good cheap spring from. Feels fine. Sounds good. It's not only that sliding contact. There's also the rotating contact where this this uh, pickup piece has to have a wire attached to it somehow, somewhere. And uh, it could be trouble there. So it's not, it's not just the contact you can see. There's another one. I could put cleaner on that. But just guessing. Okay, let's look underneath it again. Pretty much, I think, once the tubes are lighting properly, apply a little B plus and this thing will work. That's what I suspect is going to happen. But there's really not much repair work involved here. There's nothing much to repair. Uh, so the two tubes in question are up behind these coils, which I have to assume are tricky to, to remove. And you can see these, these wires coming up through holes and they're soldered here. They'd all have to be desoldered and bent straight so you could pull this guy off. Don't like the look of that at all. You can actually feel how stiff these things are. They are really stiff. They're really not flimsy. These are not flimsy. They're pushing back quite hard. 
definitely could get up under this one. It's whoops, it's mounted just about directly in line with this. It's right under there. Can't see the wires going to it. Oh my 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 my. Just on a little aside now. Here's a capacitor sitting right here. Just built in totally in the open. There's a lead wire here. It's attaching to the part, the meat of the sandwich here. It's got two metal plates. How can that possibly work? There has to be a dielectric in there. I don't know what to do about the other thing. Let's look at this for a minute. Just for intro's sake. There is the capacitor. So I think I'm going to guess what we've got here is a, a three metal plates. The one in the middle has some kind of insulation on its sides. That's a metal plate with uh, uh, like, a, like a sandwich in itself. And the bread is something not conductive. And I guess you could tighten that screw up a bit and adjust this a little bit. I don't think it's meant for adjustment though. I think that's just the capacitor. Okay, here is a resistor. This does not look original. This does not look original. There's another capacitor right there. Resistor is kind of tack soldered on there. Oh my gosh! Look at the look at the capacitor. That's not original. A capacitor like that. It's possible that capacitor. And I'm just taking a guess. Is actually part of what's bypassing this transformer, which is defective. It's a good guess that the audio transformers are defective and they bypassed it with the capacitor back in the day doing the uh, capacitor type connection between stages which is so common in fact very seldom would you find an audio transformer involved in something like that today if ever um, this capacitor technique uh, wasn't utilized back then now what is that? Is that another capacitor? What is that? Well, I'm not sure what, what exactly that is. Might as well check whatever we can see. Here we get a look under the uh, under the green green cage. Turn my camera upside down. Well, we can get a look under here. Uh, take a little bit of time to figure out what I'm looking at exactly. Wow, lots of stuff under there. Any more changed out parts? Give me more light. This is the uh, on-off switch right here. Can't quite see exactly how it's working, but uh, that's the tuning. Exactly, that double riveted thing is there. I'm not sure what that is. A spring of some sort? I don't know. Oh, some writing here. I think 
think that's right from day one. Whoever built this, I think they, they signed it, E7. Who built this? E7 built it. Or maybe who inspected it? Uh, okay, uh, I don't know what to do exactly. We've got cleaning. I can't really abrade it very much. Um, cleaning fluid, get in there with a stiff brush of some sort. Try to broom it. Did I notice this the other time too? This coil and this coil got the same color. This one's got a different color. What happened to this? These have number, numbers on them. It says, looks like 70. This one, I can't read it, 67 or something like that. And 51. It's possible the factory was making four or five different radios and making, using multiple different coils. And the, these coils were being built in the coil shop they had to number them before they put them on the shelf. And the guys in the factory would come and say, okay, I need a, I need a 51, I need a 70. I don't know. Uh, okay, well, that's all I got. All I got is, I got next to nothing here. You know what, it can't be a contact problem with the two tubes that aren't glowing. So maybe we can fiddle around with this guy. That's the uh, control rheostat. And see if we can't pick up power there or do an ohmmeter thing with it. Do something to prove that this is conducting current in its proper proper way. That shouldn't be too tough. Uh, got two wires coming to it. That's all. So I can see this one. This one is the slider. I can see where it's going up. And this one is catching the end of the the element that means slider this way is maximum resistance. I just put an ohmmeter across here and see what we get. That sounds like a lovely idea. The resistance is probably quite low. It's a rheostat trying to control uh, current going to the heaters. Pretty low resistance. This should show uh, the maximum. <laughs> That's quite the meter you got there, Jim. some consistency here. Three ohms. Now it is, I mean, it's hooked up in the circuit. Okay, we'll turn it the other way. We'll turn it halfway. It's halfway. Should be a zero or close to it. Uh -huh. Something else in the circuit that's uh, the tubes are in. Let me take this tube out.
And so I'm guessing these are the two that are controlled by this. That's different. Okay, so now we see... Oh, that's one way of proving... Maybe that's a way of proving which tube's hooked up to, the, uh, to this. I gotta get some clip leads on there because the readings are so inconsistent. Just picking a couple of good clip leads here. These are my cheaper ones. I did take the time to solder all of my clip leads, but a couple of them didn't work out so well. 1.7. Well, I don't think this is going to help. One of these is a resistor. with clip leads. Better clip leads are all in use. I need to lend a couple to somebody. Let's try some more. Let's try. <laughs> there we go. Okay, never mind the radio. This is all about clip leads now. Here are some better ones here. Use this black one. That's a good one. Oh my gosh. The video of me playing with cook leads. kingdom for a clip lead. Ah, this is really uh, upsetting. Did I not solder these? I was sure I did. No, it has not been soldered. Yeah, it has been soldered. Oh, the mysteries. Okay, doing what I can do here. There's a lot of cleaner in there. Go at some others. Yeah, the uh, 
push down tabs in these two sockets are right up tight to the uh, hole the pin goes through they're, they're up all the way these ones these ones are sunk somebody's put something in here that's bent these uh, too much now these are all clean and see sp sp springing right up this one too so it's really only one socket that's showing badness that's this one They look a little cleaner. Not much. So the pins only go down so far because the... Oh, that's what's happened here. They only, yeah, I got it. The pins only go down so far because the little... Uh, um, you know, uh, thing. The little thing on the side of the tube. Stops it from going further. But if this socket is uh, stretched, a little thing can slip by, and somebody can shove it in. I need to shove it in just once to ruin the uh, ruin the socket. That's probably what's happening here, and that's why I was pushing it down too. That's what I was pushing against. I was pushing it past this point and jamming those down. I was doing I was doing the same thing. Bad jam. Bad jam. Yeah, exactly how to fix that. You'd, you'd have to permanently have the tube seated lower than the uh, stopper here. Hmm. Okay. Um, the other thing I forgot to do, I think, is operate the rheostat um, and see if that doesn't change the current flow. So I'm going to set up the current flow test again, and we'll, we'll try a few more things. Maybe I've, maybe I've cleaned the problems away. Maybe. So while I'm inserting this tube, I get a chance to kind of feel the action here. So I'm going to put it in. I'm watching the pin. Oh yeah, the pin is, is completely free to go too far. So that's the pin bottom there. The tube really can't go any further. But if I just let the pin slide by, and I'm pushing on those springy things. And with the pin in place, I don't think there's contact down there. Not not contact consistently. So we really would need to do a couple things. You know, you know what I just realized too? Let's pull this tube out. So I've been looking at the split in the socket here, thinking, oh this is you know what sockets have. I don't think sockets have splits in them. No. So that's an example of the fracture of the socket all the way through. There's more cracks forming. And somebody put this on to try to tighten this right up. Oh my gosh. You need a pretty strong... We have to do this. You need a pretty strong... Pretty, you need pretty strong. That's for sure. You might need two two sets of wires to do it. You want it like that. Oh, that's just... So there's a huge amount of stress, or uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, springiness in this metal. No wonder it cracked. It It's made with a huge amount of, of that in it, and, uh, and that's, why it, that's why it cracked. And uh, wow, we're trying to hold that together. I mean, I'm really squeezing it. If I don't do that, the pin will miss this and down it'll go. Or alternatively, if I do do that, the pin won't be able to escape this. I'll never make contact with those pads. I have to spring the pads back up and no way to do it. That's a problem. 
Smith's bus here. This is a bit of a show-stopping problem here, uh, right off the bat. There must be some easy way to overcome this kind of thing. Just goes to show again that when you're working on these old things that you're not familiar with, I'm not completely familiar with it. I mean, every radio I get is a little bit of a new story. Um, you can very innocently do something that leads you into a very serious problem like this. Very innocently, just pushing the tube in like I was doing earlier. I was pushing it down, trying to make contact. I'm innocent, I tell you. I'm innocent. Here's an interesting thing here. So all these capacitors are made just like modern capacitors. This stator part is on insulators and the rotating part is actually grounded. It's actually grounded somehow. And how have they done it? Can you see that there's a piece of metal here? A spring coming around. It's soldered to the rotating shaft and then somehow connected to this rivet thing here. That's the kind of thing that would uh, give up the ghost. This one's okay. And often they have more than one of something like this. They might have two. No, it looks like it's just this one. They're depending on this connection to give a good, good solid ground. To attach these to the frame, and then the frame is somehow round. I can see a terminal strip right here. Probably doing it. That's probably it. Oh my gosh. This resistor appears to be in clips. So this must be part of the, because you can remove it so easily from the top, this must be part of the uh, I don't know, that's not a very high resistance, is it? I'm not sure, but it's another contact issue. Uh, this may not be making really good contact. Seems to be, though. I was going to say, it must be part of the uh, uh, grid leak system, but this is the grid leak resistor here. So I'm not exactly sure what that one is. Why do they have it up on top here? In a in a in a replaceable way. Don't tell me that's the fuse. Could that be the fuse? Hey, there's something written right here. Right here. Black, red stripe black red stripe <laughs> okay black red stripe um, okay just make a note of that somewhere hmm all I can do is stick it stick the tube back in have I lost track of the tube here it is stick it in properly just there's nothing. So what's happening is it's coming down. One of these pins is hitting one of those spring pads, and that's that's the end of the run right there. Because there's nothing pushing it down to make more contacts. I'll leave this tube right out. The tubes are running in parallel. Um, they're not in series, so I don't need all the tubes in to experiment with them. We'll leave that tube out because it's so questionable what's going on there with the socket. And the rest of these, we know the sockets look to be in good shape. Okay, back back to getting the uh, ammeter going and all that. I really need to ask myself too about all these clip leads that I'm using. Uh, I know every time you use a clip lead, you know there's a bit of a risk that the clip lead is misbehaving itself. They're cheap things. These mine are really cheap. And, you know, maybe there's problems with these clip leads uh, restricting some of the current. But I do have a voltmeter measuring the voltage going right into 
the socket. So, okay, we power on. Oh, you know what? I want to power this on with the just in case there's some kind of a jump in output from my supply. Which I don't think was the case. Okay, I'm gonna hook them up. 5.5, no, the switch is not on yet. And I'm just gonna reach under here. We're gonna turn on the set. This roughly the same current flowing because this tube wasn't doing anything anyway. Now it's a quarter amp per tube, so that's three quarters. That's three of four tubes are lit in here right now. That'd be my my figuring. Okay, off with the lights. Okay, so I can clearly see. Uh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. Two tubes. I can see three tubes glowing. Okay, you know what? I see this tube, this tube, this tube glowing. This one not. So let's fiddle with this. Okay, we'll keep our eyes on the current meter. that there is some current flowing in it. Let's try the rheostat now, which uh, I can't remember where I set it. Okay, rheostat. So that's one extreme, 0.65. The other extreme, 0.69. Well, that's a tiny variation, but it is varying. That's 64. 69. Now, how can we tell for sure if this tube is, is going or not? This one. Well, if we, if we take it right out, should see a drop in the current. That doesn't qualify as a drop, I don't think. Seventy-five, but that might just be a meter thing happening there. about the tube itself. I tested all these tubes, they all tested good. Let's stick let's stick a different one in. This is a 201. Yes. Sixty seven. Tube goes in, jumped to eighty three and then fell back. It's a cold heater drawing current. Change the uh, current flow here. Oh, we got a little more out of it. 80, 85, 86. I think, I think they're all heating up. You can watch the voltage too. It's uh, 4.98. I'm definitely varying the current somewhere. We'll leave it running full blast. But exactly five volts there too, which is kind of nice. Okay, to the darkness. So, yeah, you know what? All four of them are lit. I can see all four of them. Well, it's supposed to be a quarter amp, so that should be a full ampere flowing. We're at uh, you know nine. Well, it's close to an amp, isn't it? Really, it's 0.9. You could say that's 0.9 of an amp. Okay, I think we got there.
I do. I, I can push the current up if I just raise this voltage a little bit. We might get it dead on. Okay, four tubes operating. Not the fifth tube. Okay, fifth tube. Fifth tube. Make sure I get the right kind of tube here. 201. Okay, now Mr. Current. Okay, dropping the tube in. Wait a minute here. I just back up a little bit. You can kind of see what I'm doing. Dropping the tube in. Dropped in. Okay. With just the tube weight, pulling it out again. So th this should really jump well over an amp at this point. But this this guy's conducting. Okay, dropping it in again. Okay. Oh, you see it go over an amp there. So so that that there it is. Got my hand on the tube though. Okay, let me lock it in. It's locked in. There we go. This radio might operate right now. If I had a speaker on it, it might actually be operating right now. Oh, how can it operate? No B plus. Okay, so I see one solution is to fix this tube downwards with something, like a something to pull it down on a permanent basis. And we're we're there. Okay, so. B plus is the next issue. So I'm going to turn the set off here. Set is off. And the current flowing. B plus. Okay. So I reasoned out that there were two voltages required to operate this set. One would be the B, B plus, main, the main B plus, and then the detector B plus. I have to get a couple power supplies set up to, to add them in here.